the math section is possibly the scariest part of the ACT exam. And some people even say that it's harder than the SAT's math section, but you don't have to worry about it because you clicked on this video and you're gonna be prepared. So here are five practice problems that will help you absolutely destroy and obliterate the ACT math section. So here's the first example that we'll be doing. It says, if X equals two and Y equals four, what is 3x squared minus y squared? So remember that whenever an algebra problem tells us that two things are equal to each other, we can replace them with each other in the equation. So for this, we're just gonna take these letters because we can't really do math with letters, right? But it tells us that they're equal to numbers. So we can just replace these letters with those numbers. We were told that x is equal to two, so we're just gonna replace x with two. And we're putting it in parentheses because if you didn't put it in parentheses, then it would say 32, and it's, it's not 32, right? And then we know that y is four, so we're gonna replace y with four. And now our math problem here is entirely with numbers. There's no letters in it, so we can just solve it like a normal math problem. And remember that according to PEMDAS, which is just the order that you should do things in, we don't have anything inside of parentheses, but we need to do e exponents before we do anything else. So these two things are exponents here. So let's solve our exponents. So the three stays the same and then two to the two or two squared. That means two times two, which is four. And then minus, and here we have four squared. That means four times four, which is 16. So we've solved our exponents and now we need to do our multiplication and division. Uh, we only have one multiplication here, it's right here and three times four is 12. Now, all we have left here is subtraction, and it looks like we're gonna be getting a negative number, which can be pretty confusing. Now, you do get a calculator on the ACT, so if this confuses you, you can just put it in your calculator and it'll give you the answer. But I feel like a good way to look at these kinds of problems is to think of it as money. So for example, let's say you earned $12 and then you spent $16 on something. Well, in this case, if you earned 12 and then lost $16, you've lost a total of $4, right? So yeah, negative four is the final answer to this problem. Now the ACT and the SAT as well, if you take that, are going to have a lot of word problems. And word problems often don't take any more complicated math. Sometimes it's even easier, but you have to know how to apply it from a real life situation. So here we have a car that's averaging 25 miles a gallon and a gallon of gas costs $3.80. So how much would it cost to drive the car 2,000 miles? So here I've written down the three important pieces of information that we have. So how can we use this to solve our problem? Well, I feel like the thing that trips up a lot of students with word problems is they think they need to come up with some magic, like super hard, complicated algebra equation to represent the situation. But sometimes you don't even have to write out a formal equation. Sometimes it's better to just think about it logically, like you would solving a normal math problem in your everyday life. So we're trying to find how much money was spent in total total, but we already know how much a gallon of gas costs. So what kind of information do you think would be really useful here? Well, if we know how much a gallon of gas costs, I think it would be also helpful to know how many gallons we're using, because then all you have to do is take the amount of gallons, multiply it by $3.80, and we'll have our final total. Just like if you went to the store and cereal boxes were $5 and you bought four of them, you would do five times four. So how do we find out how many gallons we used? Well, we know that for every 25 miles we drive, we're using up one gallon. And we know that we've driven 2,000 miles. So using just kind of the logical part of the brain that's used to solve math problems in everyday life, how do you think we'd figure out how many gallons we used? Well, if we divide 2,000 miles by 25 miles per gallon, and remember that you can just put this in your calculator, you don't have to do this in your head, but 2,000 miles divided by 25 miles a gallon, 2,000 divided by 25 is 80. So we can say that we've used 80 gallons of gas. And if you're not sure that you did that right, you can just kind of think about it logically. Does it make sense that on a 2,000 mile drive, we used 80 gallons of gas? I mean, that seems like a kind of reasonable number, right? So we know that we've used 80 gallons, and we know that a gallon of gas is $3.80. So to figure out how much money we've spent, we'll just multiply them together. So we'll take 80 times $3.80. And if you put this in your calculator, you should get 304. So there we go, we figured out how much money we've spent in total. We've spent $304 on gas for this trip. Now from looking at different ACT practice tests and stuff, I've noticed that they really like to test you on geometry. And it's another word problem. So let's take a look. It says that super cool high school is located six miles east and eight miles north from your house, how far is it away from your house? So whenever we come across these geometry-based word problems, 
what we need to do is draw a diagram. And yeah, I know that drawing a diagram seems kind of cheesy and sometimes it's pretty pointless, but in this case, I think it's going to be really useful. So first let's draw our house because that's an important part of this problem, right? So let's go ahead and draw a little house. So there's me, right? Give myself a little smiley face. Awesome. Don't do this on the ACT. It's a waste of time. So then let's just go ahead and draw what we know. So we know that super cool high school is six miles east. So let's just go ahead and draw a little arrow going to the east. And then we can just label this as six miles. So we know that it's six miles this way. And now it says that it's eight miles north. So we need to go eight miles up. And then we can just label this eight miles. And then here we have our school. So let's just go ahead and draw a little school. I mean, not going to lie, this kind of looks more like a castle than a school, but you know, maybe your school is a castle. I, I don't know. So the question is asking how far away is our school from our house? Well, you could just say, okay, well, six plus eight, right? We got to go six miles this way and eight miles this way. So it's 14 miles. No, because there's actually a faster way to get to the school. And that's by just going straight there. So we'll draw another arrow here that shows that we're going straight from our house to the school. And remember that when we don't know a number in algebra, we use a letter instead. And our favorite letter in algebra is X. So we're going to put X here. And this is what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the length from our house to our school on this diagonal line. Now, if you remember from geometry, this little setup here should look pretty familiar. When you have a triangle here, and specifically a right triangle, a right triangle is when one of these angles is exactly 90 degrees, right? It's got like this, you could put a little box here, basically. Whenever you have a side missing from a right triangle, we can use something called the Pythagorean theorem. Now, if you don't already know the Pythagorean theorem, it basically says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Well, that's pretty pointless if you don't know what the letters actually mean, right? So it's important to understand the formulas as well. So a and b just represent sides of the triangle. So in this case, we can call those six and eight. But the important part is that c is always the longest side. It's always the diagonal side as well. So this diagonal side is going to be C. And then these are going to be A and B. It doesn't matter which. So if we plug in what we know for A and B, we can solve for C and find out the length of this side. So we'll just call this one A. So A is going to be six. So six squared plus, and then we know that the other side is eight. So it's gonna be eight squared equals C squared or in this case, we're going to call it X because that's the number we're looking for. And now if we just simplify this down, we can figure out what X is. So six squared, that means six times six, which is 36. And then eight squared, that's eight times eight, which is 64. And then the equals X squared just stays the same. So 36 plus 64, you can put that in your calculator, you'll get 100. Now we've simplified this as much as we can, but we need to solve for X, which means getting X by itself. And the only thing that's stuck to this X right now is this squared. So what's the opposite of squaring? Well, the opposite is square rooting. So if we square root both sides, then we can get X by itself. So the square root and the squared cancel, and we just have X equals the square root of 100. So what number can you multiply by itself to get to 100? Well, if you didn't know this, you could put in your calculator as always, but the square root of 100 is 10. And technically negative 10 could work as well, but you're not going to walk a negative distance to your school. So we're going to use the positive amount. So there we go. We've solved the problem. Our house is 10 miles away from the school. Now, a pretty common type of problem on the ACT is something that looks like this kind of a geometry thing with a bunch of lines and degrees and letters and it can seem really confusing, but if we take things one step at a time, then we can just use a couple geometry rules to figure out the answer. And as I'll show you, sometimes you don't even actually have to know specific geometry rules to solve these kinds of things. So the important thing to know, first of all, for these kinds of geometry problems is what these letters and stuff even mean. So it says that we need to solve for angle CAD. Now, what does that even mean? Well, to figure out what angle we're talking about, we basically just need to connect the dots. So if it says angle CAD, then we're going to start at C, we're going to draw a line to A, and then we're going to draw a line, and then we're going to draw a line to D. And this is the angle we're talking about here. And usually it's the letter in the middle. So CAD, A is in the middle. 
that's usually where the angle is located. So we're solving for this angle right here, and we're going to go ahead and put an X there to represent that. So there's actually two different ways that I can see that we can solve this. So if you want to try to figure out at least one of those ways, then you can pause the video and see if you can figure it out yourself. So the first thing that I'm seeing is a rule about parallelograms, and we can know it's a parallelogram because these lines are parallel. That's why it's called a parallelogram. Now these little tick marks here, these little dashes in the lines, those represent being parallel. So these two lines that both have one little tick mark, though that means that those are parallel. And then the ones with two tick marks, those are parallel to each other. And if we have a parallelogram, then one of the rules here is that if two angles are next to each other, like this one and this one, or this one and this one, they are going to add up to 180. So we know that this angle and this angle, which by the way includes both the x and the 50, is going to equal 180. So to figure out what this section is, first of all, we need to take 180, which is our total amount of degrees, and if we subtract the 70, then 180 minus 70, if you put that in your calculator, you're going to get 110. So what that tells us is that if this angle here is 70, then this angle needs to be 110 to make them add up to 180. But remember that we're solving for x, and x is just this section of the angle here. So we know that this whole thing is 110, but this part is 50. So what is the other part going to be? Well, we can do the same thing. If the total is 110, and this part is already taking up 50 of it, then the other part is going to take up the remaining section. 110 minus 50 is 60. So we know that x here has to be 60 degrees, and that's our final answer. Now there's another way that you could have solved this, and that's using another rule. Now the other rule is that because this line here is going in between two parallel lines, it actually means that this angle and the other angle on the other side of the line have to be equal to each other. So this has to be 50 degrees, and all the angles of a triangle have to add up to 180. So we have 180 in total in this triangle here. By the way, I'm talking about this triangle. This angle here is taking up 70 of them, and this angle here is taking up 50 of them. So all that's left for this angle here is 180 minus 70, which is 110, minus 50, which is 60. Now, if you didn't know all of those geometry rules I just spat at you, that's totally fine. You don't have to remember all the rules but you might have noticed something in common with them. You probably noticed that pretty much every single rule that I just listed has to do with angles adding up to 180 degrees. And there are also a lot of geometry rules that add up to 90 degrees. So I would say that 180 and 90 are like the magic numbers of geometry. If you're not sure what a rule says, then it probably is saying that things add up to 180 or sometimes 90. So yeah, it's important to know these different geometry rules like triangles adding up to 180 and things like that. So definitely look at some more geometry practice problems so that you can get a feel for what kinds of things they expect you to know. Now enough of the geometry, here's one more final practice problem and this is going to be sort of algebra, but really it's just going to be logic and working backwards. So we see that John's bank account on his 17th birthday had $200 more than on his 16th birthday. And we also know that today, which is his 18th birthday, his money is doubled from before. But notice how it doesn't give us his money at the start. It gives us his money at the end. So for example, let's say he had $100 on his 16th birthday. Let's say that the problem told us that. Well, to figure out how much he had at the end, all we need to do is do each of these steps. So on his 17th birthday, he added $200. So now he has 300. And then from the 17th birthday to his 18th birthday, it doubled. So it doubles from 300 to 600. And our final answer would be $600. Well, instead, in this problem, they've decided to give us the final amount, which they've told us is $700. And we need to figure out what he had on his 16th birthday. So to do this, we just need to work backwards from what it gave us to figure out the initial amount, the starting amount. So what number do we need to double to get to $700? That might be a little bit harder to figure out, but really all you have to do is do the opposite of doubling. Remember that doubling basically just means the same thing as multiplying by two. That's what you're doing, right? So what's the opposite of multiplying? Well, it's dividing. So if we divide by 2, we'll get our first number. So if you put this in your calculator, 700 divided by 2 is 350. 
So we know that initially, before he doubled his money, he had $350. And if you weren't sure, you can you could do it the other way. You could take $350, multiply it by two, and if you get $700 again, then you did it right. So we know that he had $350 on his 17th birthday, but what did he have on his 16th birthday? Well, it looks like he added $200. So to work backwards and figure out what he had at first, we'll do the opposite of adding, which is subtracting. So we'll subtract $200. So we had 350 minus 200. And if you put that in your calculator, you would get 150. So John had $150 in his bank account on his 16th birthday. So I hope that this video kind of gave you a feel for the things that you're going to need to know for the ACT math section. And if you're wanting to get a little bit more exam practice, then I do have another video that you can watch right here. And as always, if you have any questions about this video, go ahead and leave it in the comments and I'll be sure to answer your question. Thanks for watching and good luck on the test.